Be seated. I don't think that many of you know this, what I'm about to tell you, though you may have uh, surmised it, and that is I have never, ever liked to run. I am not a runner. When I went off to school at Chapel Hill, it was the largest class the university had ever seen, 2,400 students, and we were had to take a physical agility test. I didn't finish last, but the guy who did finish last had just fallen and broken his ankle and was on crutches. And then, and this was somewhat painful, my youngest daughter one time said, you know, Dad, I've never seen you run. So, this is, today's gospel is all about running. It is about a father who runs. It's a very dramatic tale about family conflict, a runaway from home, and a joyful reunion between father and son, and a sub-note is the jealousy of the other brother. This parable of Jesus has been traditionally called the prodigal son, but I think there are better names for it. Some have called, called this, and I think more correctly, the parable of the waiting father. The parable, the best name, the best name is, I believe, the parable of the running father. The parable is a story with a pretty clear uh, point, and that is that the younger son has run away from home, wasted his inheritance, and squanders it until he is desperate, and then comes to his senses, and he heads home to grovel and beg forgiveness. His father greets him surprisingly with joy, and they are reunited. There's one important, one important detail about the joyful reunion of father and son, and that is that in the parable, the father upsets all of first century Mideastern protocol and decorum when he hitches up his skirts, as it were, and runs to greet the returning son. Had the father followed Mideastern decorum for the, the, the great potentate of the family, he would have sat on a cushion and probably in a tent or in, a in the house. His son would have been brought to him and cast on the ground to grovel before his father, who then might either meet out punishment or who knows what. He would have begged forgiveness, the son would have, and he may have received it, but maybe not. But that doesn't happen in this parable. The father runs, runs, unheard of scandalous. He runs to hug his wayward son and to welcome him home. This is, this is a detail, but it is too important to miss. And it would not have been wasted on those who were hearing Jesus tell the parable. They would have been shocked. The point of the parable is to demonstrate the depths of love that God has for all God's children, wayward or not. But back to running. Even though I don't much like running, I've done a fair amount of running, at least maybe not physical running, 
but I've done a fair amount of running away from God, just like the prodigal son. And I wonder if you might have run away from God as well. Running away from God is an old story. We follow in the footsteps of Grandfather Adam and Grandmother Eve in running away from God. You know that story, I hope. The apple tree, the snake, and all that. And then what do Adam and Eve do? They run and they hide because they were suddenly afraid of God. God, God is walking in the garden in the cool of the evening, says Genesis, and he doesn't see Adam and Eve. And the question is, why are you hiding. It's the oldest story in the book, <laughs> running away from God. The, 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 the biblical witness is filled with stories about people running away from God and for all the same reasons as the prodigal son. We run away because, because we are afraid of God we run away because we fear God's judgment. We run away because we are afraid of being punished. We run away because we fear going, being sent to hell. We run away because we're afraid of the truth. We run away because we feel guilty, because we feel lost or scared or resentful or shameful or angry. And so we run and hide like Adam and Eve. And then we blame God for it. Insurance companies often call unexplainable events like hurricanes or earthquakes acts of God. Poor God. <laughs> Why blame God for all our ills? We love to do it. Why not call these disasters acts of the devil? Why fear when, as I read the Old Testament and New Testament witness, why fear when every time there's a significant encounter with Jesus or an angel, the first words to the frightened, the frightened recipients are, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. But then there's another point to the parable. Besides, don't be afraid. And it's a subtle point, but it's a vital point. The idea in the first century Mideast culture, the father was a potentate. He was a, a, a dictator. He, he was... Uh, he was the generalissimo of everything within that family orbit. And the idea of the father getting up and running to meet someone who was not his equal is a shocking picture indeed against all etiquette and protocol of the first century. And yet, there's the father in the parable running, running. Can you imagine running down the aisle of the cathedral to meet his wayward son at the west doors. So the name, best, the third name of this parable, besides the prodigal son and the waiting father, and this is the best name, is the parable of the running God. You see, the, the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament, the bib whole biblical record, is not a God from whom we flee in fear much as we want to. The biblical record points to a God who indeed runs towards us to embrace and forgive and to welcome. This is the great story of the Old and New Testament. The love of God, the love of God 
who searches for his rebellious children. The prodigal son ran off to find himself. Perhaps part of his search was to find, to find God. How much time is spent in a search for God? Have you searched for God? I have. We all have. Everybody searches for God. The trouble is, we can never find God. God is unfindable. God is too far beyond our spiritual and mental comprehension. In the end, at least in my estimation, trying to find God is, is a futile endeavor. But Christianity and Judaism make a rather astonishing claim. And that is that we want and we can't find God on our own. Indeed, astonishingly, it is God who finds us. Like the waiting father running toward his beloved son, or Moses on Mount Sinai, or Samuel in the temple, or Isaiah in the temple, or Andrew and Peter and John fishing quietly by the sea of Galilee when Jesus approaches, or Lazarus waiting in his tomb dead, or Paul on the road to Damascus. But more than that, God also finds us in the simple act of giving someone a cup of water or standing around the altar and waiting for a bit of bread, a sip of wine, or a hand of blessing on the shoulder, or an embrace at the peace, all of which are first and foretastes of the embrace that God has for us in his search for us. Once we stop, once we stop our futile search of trying to find a God to fit the, our own needs and desires or our own pictures of God and open ourselves to God finding us as we make acts of sacrificial love and generosity in those very acts of self-giving is when we find that God has already found us. And then we are truly we who are found by God, who, who rushes toward us, even in the simplest of acts of kindness, like an embrace at the peace or a handshake. And God rushes toward us to embrace and enfold us in a divine, in a divine hug and the loving embrace that has no beginning and no end. 